Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Joel Rosen and I'm really excited that you've decided to opt in and watch this video because it means that you are looking for solutions as to A, why you are suffering with a brain-based problem and B, most importantly, what you can do about it naturally. I'm sure that you're frustrated, you're skeptical, you've been from one doctor to the next, you know how much your brain-based problem is impacting your day-to-day -day basis just based on not feeling motivated, not having energy, having raciness of your heart perhaps, perhaps you're cold all the time, perhaps you um, don't remember where you put the car when you come out of the shopping mall, or you may be in the middle of a conversation and you forget what you're going to be saying, or you're not losing weight, or your gut dysfunction is causing you problems with going out for dinner, you're not sure uh, what you can eat that's going to set it off, or you're having to run to the bathroom from one problem, to, uh, from, from, you know, from one food to the next, and right now your life is in turmoil, or it, it perhaps is trending towards that way, or you know someone in that area and you're trying to gather information for them, and that's why I've produced this video, because I find that most patients that we consult with in our practice that have brain-based disorders are not getting the results or not getting the therapies or the treatments that they need. And they're going from doctor to doctor with their big paper, you know, from, from stacks of paper. And I joke around saying they're Santa Claus bag of supplements, but yet they're not getting any better. And more often than not, they're on three, four, five, seven, ten, twelve different types of medications. And they're going for MRIs and they're doing all this special testing, yet the doctor can't find anything. If that sounds familiar, then this video is for you. I try to produce these videos to give you information and B, make sure that you watch these videos before you come and see me to make sure that this is a right fit for you and it makes sense and you're nodding your head saying, yeah, that's exactly sounds like me and that's what I need. And B, you're, you're, you're willing to make the sacrifices because at the end of the day, it's going to require some sacrifices on your part. And we're going to explain that to you. But, but if you get better and you're living the life that you want to, you're focused, you're concentrated, you're not depressed, you're not anxious, you're not irritable, irritable you're sleeping, you're waking up with a lot of energy, you're doing the things that you love to do, that you used to do, that you want to do, then it's all going to be worth it for you. So I guarantee that you're going to get a lot of information out of this video today. I want you to get a pen and paper and write things down because you're probably going to hear things that you've never heard before. In fact, this, this uh, presentation is based on brand new research that many doctors don't understand themselves simply because they don't go and continue up with their research. And that's what I do. I take, uh, I take a number of hours every week, every month, on continuing education, on trying to help understand what brand new literature is that's out there that explains that can help people that have these chronic problems so that I can help you recover and get better. Because besides being a great father and a loving husband, my goal is to have a success story in my office where patients have been everywhere, they're not getting better, and they come here and we look at their their case or their presentation a little bit differently, a little bit outside the box, but it makes sense to them and we ultimately get them better. So sit back and relax, take a lot of notes, and hopefully it's going to make a lot of sense to you. You're going to watch this, you're going to call my office, and we're going to get your life back. So let's, let's go forward. So the title of this presentation today is called, Why Isn't My Brain Working? And basically, it's a revolutionary understanding of the brain decline and effective strategies to recover brain health. It's all based on this amazing book. It's called Why Isn't My Brain Working? And it's the same title. It's by Dr. Karazian. He's got another book called um, Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms Even Though My Blood Tests Are Normal? And this book is his prequel to that, or sorry, his sequel to that. And it's a great book. We, we give those out at our workshops. We have this book in our office, and ultimately, I am doing the Cliff Notes version for you in that book, because as you'll see, there's over, you know, there's over 500 pages, and it's really great reading. It's a little bit technical, but ultimately, if you're suffering with these problems that we're presenting today, then you'll want sort of an inside scoop on why, and most importantly, how you can fix it. In that book is questionnaires to determine what may be the cause of these brain-based disorders. Is it a part of the brain that's in the back? Is it part of the brain that's in the front? Is it part of the brain that's in the side? 
is it maybe metabolic issues you're not making energy effectively you may have inflammation you may have leaky gut you may have blood sugar imbalances anemia as food sensitivities infections exposures to toxins all of these things or you could have a combination of these things and guess what no pill is going to fix that because they can't you know you can't medicate yourself to good health Sure, medicine does a great job when it comes time to helping people that have an acute problem, whether it's a heart attack, a stroke, uh, God forbid, a car accident, or a, um, an infection, or a broken bone. But when it comes time to fixing a chronic problem of all the things that we just mentioned, fatigue, and brain fog, and not sleeping, and not having energy, and feeling cold all the time, and having hormonal imbalances, it's not gonna fix all of that. And that's what we can do, is we can get to the source of the problem, and identify all these triggers, remove them as much as we possibly can, and support the body so that it can effectively recover. Because I believe that the body has the ability to recover naturally, if it's given the proper environment to do so. And you probably agree with that too, and that's why you're watching this video. So a little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Joel Rosen. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, and I grew up there, and my whole entire family is mostly medical background doctors. My sister's a family practice doctor. My mother actually was a immunization nurse, so she would go into the school systems in Toronto and immunize the children. Uh, I had uh, all the vaccinations myself. Anytime I was sick, we'd run to the um, medicine closet for antibiotics. I had tubes put in and out of my ears because of ear infections uh, five times. And I have a very bad cerebellar problem. So I'm also not even the president, as they like to say. I'm a client too. And I've been able to help myself naturally recover. And so I went to school in uh, Canada for an undergraduate in exercise physiology. I also earned a second degree in psychology, and then I went to school in California for chiropractic because I had hurt my back, and it was like an epiphany for me. I knew that my goal was to recover naturally and help those that had had injuries to help them recover naturally and avoid medications, painkillers, pain management, and ultimately surgery. So then I started practicing. I went to school in California, and then my wife and I moved to Florida in 2002 and my wife was four months pregnant, and she uh, had just moved to a state that I didn't know anyone. I had over $150,000 worth of student debt, and I was starting my own business, and my wife had to go on an emergency surgical procedure to help repair her cervix. And at that time, we were really concerned that we could have lost our children, and so you could imagine the stress. And so we ended up taking those twins to full term. They're now 13 years old. I'm very, very blessed and grateful to have those children. And, but it was basically the beginning of my evolution to helping people from a functional and neurological point of view because I had opened up practice. I was exhausted. I was fatigued. And someone brought in the original version to this book, which was what I mentioned earlier is, why do I still have thyroid symptoms even though my blood tests are normal? And I read that book and I was like, oh my goodness, this sounds exactly like me. I had adrenal problems, I was stressed, I had memory loss, short-term memory, um, I couldn't sleep, I didn't have energy, I'd crash around the middle of the day, had a lot of musculoskeletal pain, and I needed to get better because I have a family to feed, and I have bills to pay, and I have a career to establish. So I went through those protocols, I went through uh, graduate programs in functional medicine, I went through graduate programs in functional neurology, and now I am continuing in integrative medicine. I'm a diplomat in the American Association of Integrative Medicine. I am a certified functional medicine practitioner. I graduated from the American Functional Neurology Institute, and I'm just trying to learn as much as I possibly can on the cutting edge new techniques to help patients naturally. And so you'll, you'll, you'll benefit from my learning and, and I'm, and that's a little bit about me. So let's talk about what's gonna be covered on this video. I'm gonna to try to be under an hour. Um, I may be a little bit longer. I may go off on a little tangent because I'm very passionate about this. I really, really, I really, really, you know, um, get a lot of satisfaction on helping patients, listening to them, and understanding their, their concerns and their dilemmas and their problems, and getting them better. Because you know what, that's what doctors used to do. Doctors used to sit down 
and get to know their patients and hear their stories and hear what they're suffering with. And based on that history, they were able to come up with a solution. And they say 80% of the time, the, the, the interaction was a, was a history. And 10% of the time it was an exam, and 10% of the time it was testing. Now it's completely flip-flopped. 10% of the time it's a history, 10% of the time it's um, an exam, and then 80% of the time it's testing. And they do all these tests like uh, biopsies, and they do colonoscopies, and MRIs, and CTs, and they do all these different testing, but at the end of the day it comes down to what are they going to do to get you better. And most of the time these testings are not very sensitive. Yes, they're great if they're detecting if you have a major illness, knock on wood, like a cancer, like a tumor, like a math, a destruction. Um, but when you have a chronic problem, like I mentioned, these testings are very, very inferior. So, so that medicine does a great job when it comes time to acute conditions, but medicine does not do a great job when it comes time to a chronic condition. And you'll hear that theme a lot during this video. I sometimes get on a soapbox and discuss some of these concerns because it really frustrates me to see that medicine is pharmaceutically driven. Meaning you get a sick, you, have, you take this pill, then you take another pill for another problem, and then a third pill for a third problem, and then you take a fourth pill for the side effect of pill A, and a fifth pill for a side effect of pill B. I mean, it's ridiculous. I had a 90-year-old man in the other day, and he was on 19 medications. 19. I'm half his age, and I don't know how I would function on 19 different pills. It's just ridiculous. And so, um, you can't medicate yourself to good health. You've got to get to the source of the problem. And so, this, this presentation is going to talk about that. Meaning, we're going to talk about the underlying causes to brain decline. And most importantly, we're going to be talking about what you can do naturally to maximize your health through integrative medicine and functional neurology. So we talked about this. It's based on this book. We sell this book in our office. We don't sell it for a profit. We sell it for knowledge. And I usually require my patients that we do a brain-based therapy program with to at least watch this video so that when they sit in my office, I don't have to explain what I do. I can get right into your history and right into your environmental past. Were you exposed to any toxins? Do you have mercury fillings? Did you have vaccinations? Did you grow up in a town that there was mold or mildew or a nuclear power plant or chemicals? Did you have a family member that had an autoimmunity? What is your dietary intake like? And we spend a lot of time getting to understand what your specific needs are because every patient is different. So, let's talk about the difference between hard lesions and soft lesions. Hard lesions is when you go to a doctor and you have headaches or you have brain fog or you have some of the things that we're talking about, you're irritable, your mood is changing, your handwriting is changing, and you go seek some help, they're going to do testing and they're going to look for hard lesions. They're, these are things that are masses or tumors or destructions or major things that are going to impact your health that they can cut out or give medication for. And so you'll go to do an MRI or a CT or some kind of invasive test and there'll be a positive finding. And these are obvious exam findings. I'll have sometimes patients come in here, you close your eyes, you try to stand up and you tip over. Or you try to you know, repeatedly touch the tip of your nose and you're poking your eye out. Or I try to get you to move with, um, with coordination or I try to get your eyes to move in a certain coordinated pattern and you're dizzy, your eyes are flickering all over the place. These are obvious exam findings that even in my office, I send you out to proper neurological consultations. But it's when we see soft lesions that these patients are being told nothing is wrong with them. And so what are some of these soft lesions? These are things when we don't have coordinated movements. We see patients try to repetitively touch their hand and they're all over the place. They're not touching their nose. Their balance is slightly off. I'm touching their feet and they can't feel what toes I'm touching. I'm having them move their eyes and they get tired or dizzy. Um, they smell different scents and they can't smell out of their right nose, nostril, but they can out of their left nostril. 
they can't focus they can't concentrate yet when they do these exams there's no major findings or there's no major findings on the on the labs so there's subtle findings and these are functional problems and these problems may be kind of cute when we talk about it yeah like you know you come out of your you know the mall and you can't find your car and, and you look all over for it it's kind of cute now but 5, 10, 15 years from now, guess what that is called? It's called Alzheimer's. And that's a big problem, especially if there's Alzheimer's in the family or you want to be focused or your job requires you to be synapsing and understanding and being quick on the ball and you have to come home at the end of the day because you're exhausted and you don't want to go out of your bed because you just want to lay down and you're not motivated and your spouse is frustrated. I see that every day in my practice and we are looking for success stories. So let's talk about some of these symptoms of functional soft tissue uh, brain lesions, depression and anxiety, insomnia and fatigue and memory loss, chronic headaches and migraines, focusing attention deficit disorders, not enjoying life the same way that you used to, not social, not going out, just wanting to keep to yourself, um, emotional, you know, crying more than often, impulsive, making decisions that you didn't necessarily make before and, and doing them quicker, not enjoying and not having fulfillment in life, vertigo and blurred vision and dizziness, um, weakness, numbness, tingling in the hands, can't follow directions, digestive disturbances, high blood pressure, OCD type tendencies, mood swings, and lack of motivation. When I do a research and I do this particular slide, I see all the heads nodding. And so if you're watching this video and you see four, five, seven, eight, 12, 13 of those, then you really have some concerns and I'm glad you're watching this video. So how prevalent are brain problems in today's day and age? It's more prevalent than it's ever been. One in eight seniors are developing Alzheimer's. One in eight children, and probably even more because they're not even reported, have spectrum disorders, dementia, 24 million in the world, and will be doubled by 2040. Uh, use of antidepressants and anti antioxidant, or antioxidants, anti-anxiety medications are going through the roof. And guess what the number one cause of death is for people that are older than 65 years of age? It's balance disorders. They fall, and so you know this is this is your life that that is depending on this because you're gonna have a quality of life that is not gonna be fulfilling if you're already there already. And you know what, there is hope. I'm here to give you hope that you can get better. So what does a healthy brain need? What do we do from a functional neurology, functional metabolic, nutritional protocol, integrative medicine? Well, we need proper fuel. The brain needs fuel in the way of glucose, which we're gonna talk about because that's a metabolic problem that is just gone out of, it's an epidemic really too high or too little blood sugar that causes insulin resistance and then the sugar can't get out of the bloodstream and then the sugar can't get into the cells and into the neuron and it doesn't fire properly and there's where we get some of these brain-based disorders. Proper oxygen supply, that has a lot to do with genetic concerns, methylation concerns, B12 deficiencies, iron concerns, liver concerns, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of genetic which we mentioned. And, and patients are being told that their blood tests are normal, even though they still have fatigue and they're still not 100% anemic, but let's say they're getting a C plus on the test and they're not failing the grade and they're not being told, okay, we have some tr you know, trending anemia problems, they're told they're normal. Um, they need proper neurotransmitters. I'm getting a lot of calls now with patients saying, yeah, I know there's something going wrong with my, my child's neurotransmitters or my mother's neurotransmitters or my neurotransmitters. And you know what's great is, is that there's videos like this and there's research on the internet. And most of my patients that we consult with nowadays, they know more than the doctors. And that's great, but they need guidance, they need support, they need an advocate, they need a coach. And that's what you're doing when you come in to see me and, and pay for my care. And, and, and while we're on that topic, I would, you know, I really don't shoot the messenger, but I tell patients, unfortunately, a lot of what I do is not covered. And I wish it were, it's ridiculous that it isn't. But remember what I said, medicine is a pharmaceutically driven model and insurance companies have all the money and they make the decisions on what you're gonna do to get better and the pharmaceutical industry pays for all of that stuff. 
So what happens ultimately is you do not get quality care for your chronic condition through medicine. medicine. And, and so I always tell the story of when I graduated in 2001 and started practicing in 2002, Medicare paid more for each visit than they did in 2015. And so if everything else has gone up, my overhead has gone up, I pay the staff differently, or I um, have uh, other equipment that I have to pay for, and everything, the cost of living has gone up, but the reimbursement dollars have gone down, then do I have more time to spend with you or less time? I have less time if I'm looking to make the same amount of money. And at the end of the day, it's an economic thing, unfortunately. And so when doctors are in an insurance-based model, they have less time to spend with you. When I do my work, when we do testing and we do neurological protocols and detoxification protocols, a lot of that is not covered, and that's a shame. But then it means I can spend more time with you, and we can think outside the box, and we can get you better. And that's what healthcare has come down to today, is you have to think outside the box, you have to come out of pocket if you want quality care from a chronic condition. And I'm sorry to say it, but it's the truth. And you know what I tell patients? I give them that tough love and say, you know what, you really shouldn't care because it's, you have one life to live, and if this is the way you want to live your life, then don't invest in it. But if you don't want to live your life this way and you want to have a, a quality life in your age of where you're at now and enjoy the time with your children or your grandchildren or your parents or your neighbors or your siblings and travel and be lucid and have happiness and have energy, then you got to come out of pocket. That's the, the bottom line. It really stinks. Um, at the end of this workshop, I'll, or sorry, this, this video, I'll give you an idea on what you could be looking at in terms of what you're looking at as, a, as an investment. Um, but I tell patients, you know, we spend money on crazy things. We spend money on our cell phones. People go out to dinner three, four, five days a week. We go on vacations. We buy shoes that we've already had four or five or six different pairs for. But when it comes time to invest in ourselves, we're not always willing to do that. And that really stinks. You know, I, I make a joke, but you know, I have patients that, that if they had a bad transmission or their house had plumbing issues or there's an electrical problem, they wouldn't say, okay, let's see if my insurance will pay for this. They will say, how much is it gonna cost? And if they find that it's too much, they don't just go to Walgreens and take a pill and hope it all goes away. What they do is they call the other guy and say, hey, you guys get more, more, more expensive or less expensive. They get a second opinion and then ultimately they fix it. But when it comes time to their own problems, they don't invest the money. And so I know if you're watching this video and you are at eight out of 10 on zero being not how much you're willing to do to fix this problem and 10 being you wanna to get to the root cause of the problem, you wanna enjoy your life and approach your healthcare from an outside the box point of view and you're at an eight to be willing to do whatever it takes, then this video is for you and investing in your health is not a question. So. Um, I hate to talk about this point, but it really is a point of contention um, in that insurance doesn't pay for all of what we do. And we'll get into that at the end here. So what else do you need? We need proper activation, so proper stimulation, and we need to be less inflamed. I mean, at the end of the day, we are all inflamed. Our environment is more toxic than it's ever been. We have um, molds in the air in Florida. We have fungus and parasites and bacterias and viruses and heavy metals and mercury and aluminum. And we have pesticides and environmental chemicals and sprays, Roundup and genetically modified um, organisms and foods, hybridizations, um, contaminated water and soil. I hate to like, you know, rain on the parade, um, but really, there's a, this environment is worse than it's ever been. And I always say, you know what, you can't be neurotic, but you can do little things every day to take the burden off your body and off your brain. And I always say, little hinges swing big doors. So there's a lot of things you can do naturally to help you. But at the end of the day, these environmental triggers are creating a lot of inflammation in your body. And if you don't have these basics covered, then medication is not going to do anything. 
My job is not to take you off your medication. My job is to support you. But as you start noticing your blood values come into, into normal ranges, or what we'll call functional ranges, which we'll explain to you, as you notice you're a little more lucid and you're a little bit more crystal clear on the ball and you're synapsing better and you're motivated and your energy is up and you're not, you know, not having insomnia and you, you're just doing better, then you can go back and talk to the doctor and say, hey, do we need to be on all these medications? I'm feeling a lot better. And then slowly get off of them. And that's really the goal. So let's talk about metabolic problems. When we work with brain-based problems, we work with patients that have metabolic disturbances. So what does that mean? It means when you eat food and it gets converted into energy, then that's a metabolic problem, or that's a metabolic, that's the definition of metabolic. But when we don't have energy, and we don't, we're cold, and we're not digesting, and we have brain fog, and we have depression, then you're not getting enough energy to your brain, bottom line. And so you have metabolic problems. You're not converting food into energy. And your brain needs a lot, a lot of fuel. And so what in energy, I just sort of gave it away, but what energy do you think, what system in the body needs the most fuel? And the answer is the nervous system, the brain. It uses, it gobbles up to 30% of our total energy that we produce. So if we, you know, took out the brain and the and the nervous system and all the nerves and we put it on a table, it would weigh about 3% of the total body. But it consumes up to 30% of the energy demands that is placed on it. So what will happen is if we have metabolic issues and we're not converting food into energy, then the neurological system, the brain, is not getting the fuel that it needs. And that's the big problem. You can go for an MRI and we can see no, nothing on there, but it, you can't really see the invisible problem of neurological influences from the metabolic disturbances and the inability to make energy from your food. And that makes sense, I'm sure. So different areas of the brain are responsible for different functions. So based on a neurological exam and some questionnaires that we have you to fill out, uh, it, we can determine the different areas of your brain that are fatiguing because there are different areas of your brain. The frontal lobe is what really separates our species from any other species in that as we evolved and we, we um, got um, more and more sophisticated, then, then our frontal lobe developed. And our frontal lobe really defines our personality. It makes executive decisions. Um, like what, can, what am I going to do, um, what's my planning, what's my organization, um, social behavior, how you get along with others and how you're mindful of others' feelings, um, impulse control, so thinking about things before you actually say them because you know it's not proper, um, allows you to focus and concentrate, it allows you to plan and, and, and be motivated, and it also is responsible for voluntary movement, so gross motor movement. Um, and when we have lack of fuel into that frontal lobe, then we can see a lot of these things start to come into play. And I see a lot of frontal lobe problems with people. So what are symptoms of frontal lobe degeneration? Depression and anxiety, slow movement, a little more, little more per, you know, um, uh, uh, intentful. Um, you have to think about doing it. Mental sluggishness, so someone's saying something to you and you're hearing them, but you're not really processing the words, it's not synapsing, and then you kind of look at them with some confusion and they look at you with some confusion, and then you ask them to repeat it, but then by the time they start to repeat it, it starts to process. <laughs> I see a lot of people like that. Poor impulse control, poor focus, poor social behavior, poor handwriting, poor motor planning, poor cognitive learning. These are all frontal lobe problems. Uh, different areas of different, now let's talk about another area, the temporal lobe. So temporal lobe is responsible for hearing, for speech, for memory, for emotional responses, for smell, um, for interpreting sounds. I see people that have tinnitus, usually that's a temporal lobe based problem. They can't hear with background noise. It also houses the hippocampus and the hippocampus is really responsible for, for memory and our circadian rhythms. So being tired at night and being energetic in the morning, and whenever that is skewed, then typically that hippocampus is off. And it also impacts hormonal balance. And, and patients that have Alzheimer's have hippocampal loss of integrity. Um, so what are symptoms of temporal lobe problems? Memory loss, hearing difficulties, tinnitus, 
insomnia, abnormal shifts of fatigue during the day, and dementia. And guess what? Because the brain is a, is a big receptor, we can help the brain, and specifically the temporal lobe, by knowing the neurological links. So smell, uh, sounds, um, we, can, we can impact the brain by giving it exercises specifically to the temporal lobe in way of smell and sounds. Um, so that's the, that's the temporal lobe. What about the parietal lobe? The parietal lobe is responsible for touch, all sensation of the body. It interprets sensation, whether it's a hot sensation, a cold sensation, um, a painful sensation, a vibratory sensation. Um, it also senses stretching to the muscles, um, and also when the joint is moving, it knows what's going on. So when I see patients that are clumsy and they hit things a lot, or they have a lot of musculoskeletal pain, or they have neuropathy, then I know that they have a, um, a parietal lobe problem. And so what are symptoms of parietal lobe degenerative changes? Um, they're unstable in the dark or they're unsteady on surfaces. They misjudge where their body is, so they're injury prone. They can't recognize shapes when they hold it. They get lost easily and they have numbness, tingling, and different pains uh, in the body. Um, the occipital lobe is responsible for, for vision and so difficulty processing visual information, hallucinations, visual floaters, uh, visual persistence or, or reoccurrence of images once they're gone. And you know what's great about this book is we don't even have to do a neurological exam because when you fill out my paperwork that's straight out of this book and I see zeros in a category, then I know there's not a problem. But if I see twos and threes or mainly threes in that area and that's asking you about temporal lobe, then I know that temporal lobe is, is not functioning properly. Then when I do my functional neurological exam and we do smells or sounds to test the temporal lobe, then it just corroborated or um, basically drove home that that temporal lobe needs help. And I see this every day in my practice. So really the key is to fill out these questionnaires and do a neurological exam and then ultimately figure out what the cause of the breakdown was, address that, and then rehabilitate it. And that's really what we do. Um, different areas, the cerebellum is also known as the little brain, and this basically calibrates motor contraction. Um, it also um, allows that inner ear to, to communicate to that brain. Um, it's responsible for muscles and joint information. And so what are signs of, of cerebellar fatigue? It is dizziness, vertigo. That's what I get a lot of because when I had tubes put in and out of my ears, um, I lost that um, that sensory input from the ears to the brain, to the cerebellum. So I get dizzy if I go on a boat or I get dizzy if I go in a car. I've gotten a lot better because I give myself my own rehab. But I can find one. It takes one to know one and I see cerebellar fatigue all the time. Poor balance, uh, subtle shakiness at the end of movement and also spinal problems because the spine is one of the main things that stimulate the cerebellum. Lastly, we have the brain stem. So the brain stem is basically at the, the, the base of the brain, and it houses most of the cranial nerves in the body. And the cranial nerves are responsible for our parasympathetic and our sympathetic output. And so we have that sort of that fight or flight mechanism. And so it controls breathing, it controls respiratory functions, digestive functions, executive functions. It controls all of that. And so the autonomic nervous system, it has two parts. It has the parasympathetic, and it has the sympathetic. And parasympathetic is more active when we're resting and we're digesting, and then the sympathetic is more active when we are on the go, go, go all the time. And these two divisions cannot function at the same time. One dominates, and so if we have great brain health, the parasympathetic state with rest and digestion can work very, very well. When we have bad brain health and fatigue, then the sympathetic system is gonna be working a lot more. And in fact, that's why some of these medications will impact the sympathetic system. But me being more holistic, I would rather do that naturally versus just taking pills all the time. And so guess which system fires the most when we're stressed? The sympathetic, and it's not just emotional stress, it's metabolic and chemical stress. Everything we've talked about up until now, having poor blood sugar, missing meals, not having a breakfast, waiting too long throughout the day to eat your next meal, having too much caffeine and stimulants, having low-grade infections in our body, whether they're viruses or parasites or bacteria or candida, 
um, heavy metal toxicities or mold exposures. All of these things are going to be stressful for the body and your sympathetic control system is going to be dominating. So 90% of the cortex or the brain's job is to help the parasympathetic activity. So when we lose this parasympathetic activity, we go into sympathetic overdrive and sympathetic system takes over. So what are some of these symptoms when you have a sympathetic overdrive uh, problem? High blood pressure, those that are taking medications, you, we can help those by getting that sympathetic system to calm down or put the brakes on, if you will. Um, and that's why we see a lot of patients that have fibromyalgia symptoms that do very well with brain-based exercises because we're getting that parasympathetic system to fire better and their digestion improves. So we'll see people that have poor digestion or headaches or chronic pain, insomnia, fatigue, hormonal imbalances, sensitivity to light and sounds, those are the migrainers, cold hands and feet, frequent urination and incontinence, erectile dysfunction, low libido, and so what causes the brain to degenerate? We talked a little bit about it, the metabolic imbalances, blood sugar imbalances, whether it's too low or too high. I think they say now greater than 60% of the patients or the people in the United States are obese. I mean, they have insulin problems, they have blood sugar regulation problems. That's gonna cause the brain to de degenerate. In fact, type three diabetes is also known as Alzheimer's. Um, poor circulation and oxygen, um, food sensitivities, leaky gut, poor gut function, not enough bacteria in the gut, inflammation from all these sources, poor neurotransmitter, hormonal imbalances, toxins, and lack of activity. So remember, you cannot separate the body, uh, the health of the body from the health of the brain. And so if we are unhealthy, then we know our brain is not ultimately working well. So let's talk about a little bit of the blood sugar, um, insulin resistance, diabetes, but there's also on the other side having too low blood sugar. And so these are people that miss meals, don't have breakfast, get shaky, lightheaded, and jittery if they miss a meal. And, and that's going to cause the same thing as high blood sugar in insulin resistance. So high blood sugar causes high insulin, which is very, very inflammatory. That's going to cause excess tryptophan and tyrosine in the brain. That's going to lead to excess serotonin and dopamine and that's going to lead to increased um, tolerance to these things. And so now you're going to find when you have an increased tolerance to these neurotransmitters that you're going to be fatigued, you're going to be depressed, you're not going to have lack of pleasure, or you are going to have lack of pleasure, all because of high blood sugar. Then on the flip side, we have symptoms of chronic high hormones um, and neurotransmitters are the same as low hormones. Our low neurotransmitters. So let me explain that. So I, people find it hard to believe when they have low blood sugar, how is that a problem like high blood sugar? And ultimately in physiology or in, in biochemistry in the body, symptoms of having too much of a hormone is the same of having too low of the hormone. It just took a different road to get there. So as an example, when you have too high blood sugar, your insulin levels are going too high, and then the cells stop listening to what the message is that insulin is saying, and they shut down. However, if you have too, too low blood sugar, then your brain interprets that as there's no sugar in the cells, so it's going to release more insulin to get whatever sugar is in the bloodstream into the cells, ultimately leading, leading to that same road. So this slide is just basically saying if you have high neurotransmitters or hormones, it's going to be the same thing as low neurotransmitters or low hormones. So the slide for low blood sugar leads to low insulin initially, it leads to low tryptophan and tyrosine, it leads to low serotonin and dopamine, and that will also cause fatigue, depression, lack of pleasure. So let's talk about stress now. I mean, we're all stressed. I see patients that tell me their parents are causing extra burdens because their health are declining or their children is declining health or their, their, their finances are in turmoil or their jobs are just are, are very, very stressful or their children are stressful or they have an infection or they had an injury or car accident or they have uh, mold or environmental toxins. All of these things are going to create inflammation in your body. And the Latin word for inflammation means to ignite. And when you ignite something, it's like taking a blowtorch and just to the screen, how well would it work? It wouldn't work very well and it's going to lead to a breakdown of that blood-brain barrier. 
So the biggest stress is not usually emotional. Patients will say to me, well, I'm not very stressed. And I say, you mean emotionally? Because how do you know about blood sugar, anemias, infections, um, uh, metal toxicities, environmental exposures, um, gut infections, anemias, uh, autoimmune disorders. We do a lot of work of autoimmunity in our office. And if you like this video, then you can watch an autoimmune video that we've produced for patients musculoskeletal pain, and poor digestion. Uh, stress hormone is cortisol, so we do cortisol testing, whether it's through urine, it's a brand new test that we're using called the Dutch test, but we've mainly done saliva samples, which will take your cortisol readings throughout the day, and it should be nice and high in the, in the morning and low in the evening, and it should be sort of like a reclining chair. And we find a lot of the times it's low in the morning and it's low all day long and that's a chronic stress response. Or it's a little bit elevated in the morning and then it just tanks throughout the day. Or sometimes we see dysregulated rhythm where it's low and then high and then low and then high. So when we do these cortisol readings, we're able to determine how much of these skewed pathways are impacting your brain and then we figure out a way to fix that. What happens at the end of the day is when we have too much cortisol and we get stressed, it slows down an area in the brain called the pituitary, and that will lead to thyroid problems and weight gain and hormonal problems. So um, hopefully this is making sense to you. Um, number three is brain circulation and oxygen. Uh, the brain consumes 35% of the oxygen that it, we take in. The neurons don't function properly if they don't have oxygen. In fact, let me see you just try to breathe for three minutes or hold your breath for three minutes and see how well you do with that. And really, we need oxygen less than five minutes before brain damage starts to, to occur in the brain. So what are symptoms of poor blood flow to the brain? Low endurance, so feeling tired after reading a little bit or not being able to concentrate very much. Uh, must exercise uh, or drink um, caffeine to have energy, uh, cold hands and feet, poor nail health. So we'll do examinations just by inspection and look at the nail beds and know that there's not a lot of oxygen occurring back into those extremity or distal parts of the body of the feet and the hands. Have to wear shoes or socks just to feel warm, cold and tips of the nose. Um, the nail beds are often pink. Um, also, poor circulation will have shallow breathing, can, you know, can't get your breath very, very quick, um, anemias, smoking, uh, low blood pressure, um, poor lung function. These are things that can cause a lot of that stuff. Diabetes, which we've talked about. So what are some botanicals? I always try to make this important. Sometimes patients aren't going to see me and I make recommendations on what they can do to increase the circulation to the brain and something called fever view extract. Ginkgo biloba, herpazine, and vinpotectin. Those are things that can really help patients, and you'll have to Google those. But we also do something called exogen, oxygen with exercise, which is a great thing to do. So now let's talk about food sensitivities. A lot of us eat GMOs or processed foods or hybrid foods or fast foods or inflammatory foods. Um, basically what happens is that the immune system mistakenly attacks that. And when it attacks that, it creates these inflammatory cells called cytokines. And then cytokines cross into the blood-brain barrier, and that causes these microglial cells in the brain to, to fire off. And then that leads to inflammation in the brain. So inflammation in the gut will lead to inflammation in the, in the brain. And so what are the most common foods that we find patients react to? are gluten, dairy, and soy. So if you didn't do anything but just watch this video and say, okay, Dr. Rosen says I need to get off of gluten, dairy, and soy, you would do wonderful. But we do testing through Cyrex Labs to determine, and we do this every day in practice, what foods you may be reacting to. Are you reacting to gluten? If you are, you need to remove it. In fact, I don't even test for gluten anymore. I just have patients get off of gluten because it's the devil. <laughs> unless you live in Europe, because we use these Roundup, we use hybrids, we use cheap crops, and ultimately your body is mistaking that as an antigen or a foreign invader, and then you react to that. So we suggest in the very least that you get tested. Poor gut function, if you have a brain-based problem and you've been to other offices or other providers and none of them have looked at your gut, then they've missed the problem because the gut and the brain are really one of the same. And if Hippocrates and old medicine said, look to the gut, 
And there's where you'll find the, the probably the origin of all human illness. And you know, as we've gone through all these centuries and come up with all these medications and have more and more sick people than there ever was because of the environmental problems, we're getting back into the gut health. And so poor brain, poor gut, poor gut, poor brain. And so what are some of the causes? I mean, everything we kept talking about. Poor gut health is from poor diets, high stress, food sensitivity, leaky gut, too much bacteria in the gut, which is called dysbiosis. For every one human cell in our body, we have hundreds of, of bacteria cells. And those bacteria better be healthy, because if they're not, then you're gonna have dysbiosis, and that's gonna lead to inflammation. And that's gonna lead to infections. And we do testing to determine that as well. Brain inflammation, this is sort of a cyclical pattern where you have bad gut function or bad uh, leakiness of your gut or inflammation in the gut, it's going to lead to poor brain function. And then brain inflammation in turn is going to lead to poor gut health. And so you have this negative spiral. So what are some of the causes of brain inflammation? We talked about this. Diabetes, insulin resistance, too low blood sugar, stress in the brain, cortisol problems, high carb diets poor circulation, food sensitivities to egg, dairy, soy, corn, rice, potato, uh, any gut inf infections, whether it's a parasite or it's fungus, leaky gut, which leads to the breakdown of, those, of the wall of the gut, um, high homocysteine levels. I see blood work where I don't even see people's homocysteine levels, and so that's a prerequisite. And even alcohol will cause these problems. Poor neurotransmitters. So basically, neurotransmitters are the, the um, chemicals that are being released between two neurons and, and so we have desensitization of these receptor sites when the drugs are, we're taking too much medication and then all of a sudden these receptor sites are resistant to the, to the information. And so what are the different transmitters, what do they do? Um, they're responsible for memory and, and comprehension, that's acetylcholine. Serotonin is enjoyment and satisfaction and sleep. Dopamine is motivation and social uh, worth, self-worth. And GABA is calming. And if we don't have a balance of those hormones and they're not being uh, manufactured and made or they're not being taken into the cell or they're not being broken down effectively, then we are gonna have some of these symptoms. And so what causes these neurotransmitter imbalances? Hopefully some of the things we've been mentioning before that you've already understood, but medications will do it as well, like SSRIs, um, proper gut function, B6 or B12 deficiencies, which a lot of the time are genetic related, and we do a lot of genetic testing in the office now. Iron deficiencies that could be because of heavy metal toxicities or liver infections or liver problems, um, anemias, um, liver dysfunction, uh, MSG, and so these neurotransmitter um, problems are all neurotoxic from some of these foods that we eat. Food sensitivities and autoimmunities, leaky gut. I mean, hopefully by now you're thinking I'm sounding like a broken record because all of these things are causing different mechanisms in the body and they're all leading to the same place that you're dealing with, poor brain function. And so we need to address them, but the thing is, you're different than this guy, which is different from this gal. And so we need to figure out where is the domino being tipped in your condition versus where is the domino being tipped in their condition. And that's what functional medicine is going to do. Hormonal imbalances. Estrogen impacts the serotonin receptors in both men and women. Estrogen also impacts dopamine and acetylcholine receptors. Um, progesterone impacts GABA receptors. Testosterone impacts dopamine receptors and acetylcholine receptors. Thyroid impacts all of these. So what does that mean? It means if you're taking bioidentical hormones or your estrogen levels are low or you're taking exogenous creams or you're a male and your hormones are imbalanced, it's gonna impact your neurotransmitters and then we're gonna feel some of these things like uh, confusion, um, not feeling excited, having anxiety, all of these things. So. Uh, all hormone production depends on adequate um, cholesterol. And so I don't want to spend time because it's getting lengthy here, but cholesterol lowering medications are designed to um, help people avoid cardiovascular events. But meanwhile, there's more cardiovascular events than there's ever been. And so we need cholesterol. We need not to say you need your cholesterol in the 300s, but you don't need them less than 150. 
Do you need cholesterol to help nerve function, help neurotransmitter function, help brain function, help hormonal production? I mean, this is a big problem. So what do we do when we're talking about cholesterol? We need essential fatty acids, because 60% of your brain is fat. Um, it's basically one gob of fat. Vegetable oils and hydrogenated oils, they're not healthy. They are typically going to cause inflammation in the body. Um, we need a proper omega-3 to a proper omega-6, so you can guess if you're eating processed foods or foods that come out of the, the pay machine and they're all packaged up, and they have hydrogenated oils, those things are gonna create inflammation in your body and that's gonna impact your brain. The brain needs at least 5,000 milligrams of essential fatty acids a day, so that's a great supplement you need to be on. Uh, toxins in your brain, toxins um, you know, can impact and can deposit on your brain. Um, there's a toxic environment in the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the medications that we take, and if our liver is not working effectively, we're not gonna get rid of these toxins and that's gonna impact your brain too. And we test for that as well. So what do our body needs to handle all of these toxins? Is it needs a proper immune system, which we talk about and what we address, and needs a proper liver and proper testing from the functional medicine point of view. Proper brain activation. Every sensory organ in the body, whether it's visual stimulation, smell, hearing, touch, taste, all of that impacts and directly stimulates the brain. The body is one big receptor. In fact, the main receptors that it processes on a daily basis is gravity and touch. So whenever we stimulate the brain through these receptors, it's activating your brain. And so if we're not getting proper activation, we're not doing a lot of activity, then we are gonna slow down the synapsing of the brain. And so what are some of the things we can do naturally? Just counseling and ex exercising, and getting out and listening to music, having hobbies, try to sleep more regularly. But specifically in our office, we do brain-based exercises. We do eye movements. Um, we do balance and coordination exercises. We do vibration. We do nonlinear movements. We do uh, timing and rhythm exercises deep breathing, we do spinal exercises, we do uh, other things that are gonna stimulate that brain. So what does a healthy brain need to, to summarize everything we've gone over? Is it needs proper glucose, it needs to be in a, an effective range, it needs proper oxygen, it needs proper neurotransmitters, it needs to properly be activated, and it needs an inflammation-free um, environment. If you don't have all of these things, and we can assess where you're lacking in all of these things, then you are not gonna get better. So what's next? What's next is you sat through this entire video. I'm proud of you. Hopefully it makes a lot of sense to you and you're willing to take the next step. The next step is to set two appointments with me, two 45 minute appointments to an hour. Um, the visit one, we send you over via internet or email or snail mail or fax, however the best way it is for us to receive it to you is to um, fill out 20 to 25 pages of my paperwork, which is gonna go over your environmental history, your social history, your family history, your greatest concerns, your, your um, growing up history, your dietary history. It's gonna include the questionnaires that we talked about in this book to identify different areas of your brain and where they're not effectively working. You're gonna get your blood work that you've had over the last couple of years. I have patients sometimes give me up to five years, but try to keep it within a couple years. And I'm gonna, you're gonna get all that together. Call me up. I'm gonna, you're gonna bring that in. You're gonna bring t-shirts and a shorts when you come in. And I'm gonna do a neurological exam. I'm gonna go over that past medical history with you. I'm gonna review your blood work. And then I'm gonna give you one of these books that I have here so that you can read that. We suggest that you be with a spouse because when we do an exam and your balance is off and you're not smelling and your eye movements are, are not focusing the way they should and you don't have coordinated movements and I'm touching your toe and you don't feel it and you're telling me I'm touching one toe and I'm touching another toe and then you go home and you tell your spouse, yeah, this is what they did, they can appreciate it. And you know what? The ones that I see in my office that are really serious, their spouse is there to support them and to see what's going on. 
if you don't have that spouse there in your life or it's a situation where you're watching a TV show in one room and they're watching the same show in another room, then necessarily you don't need to be with your spouse. But if you have a supportive spouse, they need to be here with you. Visit number two is already paid for with visit number one, which we'll get into in a second. Um, this is what I'll do is I'll tell you if I can accept your case, if I think I can help you. Um, I'm going to go over your blood work, how I put it on a functional scale, and told you here's the things that we found wrong, even though you were told nothing was wrong, because these are more narrowly focused, um, more sensitive tests to figure out if you're trending towards a glucose problem or a liver problem or inflammation problems or, or an infection. We can tell all of that, which a lot of patients just in that uh, explanation alone get a lot of value out of that. We go over the results of your neurological exams, what side of the brain may not be working, what areas of the brain may not be working. We go over the history with, your, with, your, with the, what you filled out and what's significant, what's impacting your health, what needs further elaboration or investigation. And then I go over what I recommend. And I sometimes will tell patients that I don't think I can help you. And so we need to determine that. Or sometimes we'll say, I think it's going to take some time to help you. And here's all the things that we need to do. And that is going to be my best recommendation. I'll go over the final fin financial object, uh, obligations. You can leave me your insurance information after the first visit. And I'll be able to tell you how much I expect insurance to pay for it. And, and I expect also your spouse to be here. Because on day two, I want to have a decision. I don't want to have a maybe or I have to think about it. Because those are the people that I don't think I can help. Like I said, if you need to be at an 8 out of 10 or more and you're at a 3, then I don't think I can help you. If I think you're at an 8 or you tell me you're at an 8 and you're willing to do whatever it takes to, to be able to get help, then we'll figure out a way to help you and figure out what the best recommendations are. I need you to wear your shorts and t-shirt so I can do a neurological exam with you and determine what is exactly going on. I need to have all that paperwork filled out when you come in because I set up 45 minutes to an hour of my time and if you don't have that completed and you're filling that out in my reception area, I'm not going to be able to see you on that particular day. And then bring your spouse like we've mentioned. So what is my offer? My offer is typically I charge $149 for both visits. But because you've sat and you've watched this entire video, I'm going to charge you $75. And, and if I don't think I can help you, I'll give you your $75 back. I'll also give you a copy of this book for $75. You're basically getting two exams with me, me to review your blood work, me to review, review all your history, whatever prior testing that you've done, bring those in too, me to review your neurological exam, and me to give you my best recommendations on what we can do to get your life back. If I don't think I can help you, then I will give you your money back. But I got rules of my own too. My rules are number one, you have to make some changes. If you are reacting to foods or you have infections or you have leaky gut or you have neurological changes, it's not going to be a magic pill solution. It's going to take time, energy, effort, and money to get you better. So you have to be willing to make those sacrifices. You have to take accountability for your health. Unfortunately, it's not your job's responsibility or your boss's responsibility or your spouse's responsibility or your government's responsibility or even your insurance's responsibility. It's your responsibility. Insurance or Medicare only pay a small percentage of what I do. And they don't pay for any of the testing. They pay for some of the neurological therapies that we do in my office. So I tell patients, depending on what insurance you have, how many tests that I recommend, um, what type of neurological breakdowns that you are having in your body and what I think it's going to take to get you better and what kind of coverage insurance is going to give you. It's going to cost somewhere between 200 to 400 per month between 12 to 24 months. That's a ballpark that I can give you. If you pay in full, there will be a discount or we do financing in the office that is interest free um, and there really shouldn't, we've gotten someone down to $45 a month and so there really shouldn't be an excuse of you don't have the money. Because if you can afford $45 a month for 12 to 24 months, it may not be my best recommendation. It's a start. We can start somewhere. Then you're not sick enough. You're not an 8 out of 10 on what you're willing to do to get better. So when it comes time to day two, and I explain to you it's going to be for the best recommendation, 
two hundred fifty dollars per month mrs jones for the next twenty months i don't want you to be surprised because we talked about that it may be a little less because your insurance is covering more or maybe a little bit more because your insurance is covering less it's somewhere in that area then i want a decision on day two because you know this is for you and i'm a big boy i can take it i can say you know what it's not for you you don't want to do this you didn't find the neurological exam helpful or you don't believe my recommendations, you don't know it's gonna help you. You'll hear from some patients that have suffered just like you at the beginning of this video, but at the end of the day, I wanna, yes, I'm ready to go on day two, or no, I'm not ready to go. I don't believe it's gonna help me, but I don't want I need to go home and think about it because at the end of the day, I've given you 90 minutes of my time, and it's gonna, you know, I don't wanna waste time. I wanna help patients, I wanna have success stories. But seriously, think about how much this is impacting your life. If you're not enjoying your life and you're depressed and you have anxiety and you don't have energy and you're tired all the time and you're not sleeping and you're not motivated and you're not losing weight and you don't want to travel and your spouse is miserable and your life is miserable, then you should be willing to do whatever it takes to get better and I believe we can help you. Think about how much it's affecting your relationships with your others. How much is it impacting their life? Um, due to time constraints, I, I can only accept those that are truly committed. So hopefully you found this really, really informative. Make sure you give my office a call. Let them know you've watched the entire video from start to finish. You're willing to take the $75 two visit um, opportunity. My office number is 561-883-0090. And hopefully you found this video really informative. I look forward to changing your life and giving you the life that you deserve. Thank you so much.